All right, part three, I got cut off again. I was saying that the Bible, when the books of the Bible were written, as well as many other religious texts, uh, many of these books were separated by decades, if not hundred or more years. I'm not sure of the details of how many of the books were written when, but I do know a lot of them were derived from earlier times. So that's left us to say, even if there was a hundred year gap, even between a book, let's say, two books in the Bible, that's a hundred years of human civilization. Of course, the times didn't change as rapidly back then, but imagine this. Someone starts a textbook about how to live life in the modern world, and they start it in 1700, and then you decide to write a new chapter in 2014. It's going to be fairly obvious to the reader that uh, these people are living in completely different times and cultures. The necessities are going to be different. Their desires are going to be different. Um, <laughs> this is why I can't understand how people can't get past this. This is why Bible literalism, to me, is one of the largest banes to humanity. It's, it's because if you're going to take something literally, you have to understand what it means. And I don't think that anyone really understands what these things mean. We're working on it. And I think there was a time in history when people could understand a little bit where these ideas came from. But let me go back to <coughs> the root of my, my video here, which was in the first part. I was talking about the study of theosophy, theology, uh, the idea that by studying where religion comes from, we can understand the basis for human need and desire and understand a little bit more about ourselves in the process as individuals. I'm always fascinated to learn about myself, to learn the things I do, to see my little antics, to see when somebody calls me out on something that I'm doing and I'm like, I deny it maybe at first and then go, no, they were right, I am doing that. These are the little humilities, you know, the things that make us human. And to see one another constructively criticizing each other when necessary is an important part of growth. We teach babies. We teach toddlers, you know, how to be people. And one of the big questions is, are we born with inherent knowledge? Are we born with a, a wisdom or an awareness of something greater than ourselves? Do, do we, are we born with the, the, the knowledge of God? Are we born with the knowledge of the universe? It's really irrelevant but as we, as we grow, we process things differently. Each one of us has our own way of interpreting the things that we see. And we all know that in the end, that leads us to draw some conclusions that maybe aren't quite so accurate. But we hang on to them because they're the best we have at the moment. And we try so hard to find something in the day-to-day -day you know, I, I'm kind of side sideline here, but it's something to look forward to, okay? Heaven, in a sense, or whatever afterlife you believe, is something to look forward to from this life. It allows one to live without any major expectations for society. And one of the largest issues with this for me is the folks who say, well, let the world go to shit because Jesus is going to return anyway. It's kind of like saying, don't bother cleaning the house, it's going to burn down. And, or should I say, don't bother cleaning the house because it might catch on fire and burn down. <laughs> but people are very convinced that this is going to happen, that Jesus really is going to have a second coming. I'm not sure how people individually view this, but I think that each Christian probably has their own view of how Jesus is going to return. Some people think that it might really be a white guy with blonde hair and a robe descending from the sky. Um, other folks may think that it's something more symbolic or something more energy-oriented. But thinking about that idea that we're setting ourselves up for doom by worrying too much about what's going to come tomorrow or something greater after this life because we have to live with each other and we have to find a way for our children to tolerate one another even if we can't because when we look at the things that we've done wrong the things that we've done incorrectly 
uh, we can feel that. We know it in our hearts when we've done something wrong. And sometimes we can just kind of push it to the back. A good example is self-abuse. You know, some people abuse other people, and that's a horrible thing. But m everyone abuses themselves to an extent. Even people who exercise, some people over-exercise or, or, you know, run themselves till their knees. You know, it's, it becomes an addiction, you know, the addiction to exercise. Well, or there's an addiction to drugs. But either way, you have some way of breaking up the monotony, something to look forward to. Like I was saying, people look forward to heaven. And someone made a comment on my video yesterday saying that they said that they don't have anything to look forward to day to day. I can relate to that. I have lots of things to look forward to, but they're small. Uh, and this is why, for example, I take Kratom in the morning before work. It's just an herb. Um, I get to work and I'm like, alright, this is something to look forward to. It's my, my Kratom. And then I might have a, you know, when I smoked, I'd have a cigarette. Um, I'm excited for after work so I can smoke that bowl. And then I'm mostly just excited to get home to see my family, right? So, every day I have to look for I have something to look forward to. Coming home to see my family is my biggest thing. But once you get there, it's just like, <sighs> all right, what's next? Now I'm looking forward to something else. Not that I don't love my family. It's just this constant next thing, next thing, next thing. And this is why so many people have promoted living in the now. And um, and that's almost become religious in its fervor. Uh, it's become a religion of its own, the idea of living in the now and um, and trying to let things go. And I've heard more people say, how do you live in the now, than people who say, oh yeah, I love to live in, just live in the moment. I have yet to meet anyone who can really live in the moment. Um, I've People will say they do, but the fact is, you always have to be conscious of the future. The idea is to live in the moment while using constructive uh, things you've learned in the past to improve your future. So, I get back to the religion part and why this is important. When people believe in a system, they tend to congregate in groups to reinforce that belief system. We call it an echo chamber. One person says something and they reinforce it, they sing in songs and everybody goes home happy, not realizing that, just like that church, there may have been a group of meditating, you know, hippies down the street who met in a teepee. I did a medita group meditation with like 40 people, and we called upon, the, you know, archangels and all that stuff. The lady did this whole, like, ceremony. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I had was so elated after that experience. And I realized, oh, this is, this is what people get from church. The problem being that I've not, I, I, it's hard when I meet someone who goes to church to ex try to explain to them, you can get that same feeling through other ways. And then it gets to the argument about no way, Jesus Christ is the only way to feel that way. And then it goes back and forth, back and forth. But in the end, only I know how I feel. Only I know what feelings I get from something, and only they know their feelings. So, how does the study of religion benefit us as a society? It allows us to see our shortcomings. It's just like studying history. Somebody said that it's all about, uh, you know, it's all about looking, looking, you know, looking towards the future, I guess. And and I was saying the beauty about learning history is that it allows you to live a better future. And I remember when I was in school and people would say, you know, people who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> It's like, oh, whatever, whatever. But I always understood it, you know, innate understanding of what that means, and that's true. But it's only true to an extent. Uh, but I think the problem today is that we're living in a different world than we were during the time when religion was so necessary. What we've done now is we're understanding things on a quantum level. And for those who don't know, Quantum, the uncertainty principle is one of the principles of quantum physics, which means that you can never know the state of something until it's observed, or if something even exists. And people take this too far and say everything's an illusion, nothing's really there until you look at it. It's not, it's much more complex than that. 
it's, it's, there's one experiment called Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat. It's where they had a cat in a box, and the idea is.